So here we are, Parshat Mishpatim. So this past week, when we, we learned, we were at Parshat Yitro. We learned about the, the giving of the Torah in Har Sinai. And Mishpatim is somewhat surprising where the Torah goes from Har Sinai, which is the most exalted, and it goes to something very, very down to earth. So we need to understand this, both on the level of what is going on with this Parsha, and then we're going to go into a deeper level of what it means. So Parsha's Mishpatim, Mishpatim means judgments first Parsha after the revelation at Sinai. So we might have thought that after this revelation, the Torah would continue to speak about lofty spiritual subjects. This was the highest of the high. Instead, the Torah immediately goes into legalities, including laws of servants and maidservants, cases of one man striking another and capital punishment, that seems like completely the opposite. So Parshas Mishpatim is full of halachic information, which contains major halachic sources from many parts of the Talmud. And it says that the Talmud, when it's speaking about civil law, is like a never failing spring because the laws become more and more specific and more and more detailed and more and more understood as they come down to earth. So this is this, the description of the laws is deep and continues, but it's still surprising to find halachic descriptions immediately following the spiritual experience of Sinai. How, how could that be? We're like going from the highest all the way down to the most down to earth things we could imagine. Now, Jewish courts of law are to have legal decisions that are to be God-based, not human intellect based. So what that means is that these laws are also laws that come from Sinai. These laws are not just Okay, let's go to something else. But that at Sinai, all the laws were given. We'll speak about where they're coming from and where they're going to, but they continue from Sinai. So even though Hashem wants us to use our in human intellect to understand the laws, but the Torah says that cases should go before Jewish courts of law based on decisions coming from the commandments of God. So one thing that that's saying is that, you know, we see that there are courts of law in the countries where we are living, where it sounds like some of the decisions that they make are actually similar to Torah decisions, but it's different when it's coming from God and is coming from God-based reasoning, whatever that means, and not just trying to figure out, well, that's what they say. The question is, what does God say? So after this, we see at the end of the Parsha, this is going on telling all kinds of laws, all kinds of laws that are beyond down to earth. And then toward the end of the Parsha, the description of legal matters ends and the Torah once again returns to high matters because it says Moshe and the nation's elders go up the mountain and the Torah describes an exalted scene. This is in this week's Parsha. They beheld a vision of the God of Israel and under his feet was something like a sapphire brick. So they saw a vision of God and under God's feet, whatever that means, they saw something like a sapphire brick. The Torah continues in the same profound way at the beginning of Parsha Truma. So in other words, 
last week's Parsha was the holiest of the holy. God comes down in Har Sinai. What God does there is <clears throat> that he, in a certain way, takes away the difference between above and below so that above isn't only above and below isn't only below so that we can really connect to God above and below. Then it goes from there to Mparshan Mishpatim, where it's clear that these laws are also coming from Sinai and we're going all the way down to earth. Toward the end of the Parsha, it goes away again from these down to earth laws and goes up to a very <coughs> exalted scene of a vision of the God of Israel <coughs> that Moshe and the elders had. And his, under his feet was something like sapphire brick. That had a lot of meaning. It's a very Kabbalistic statement. But they did go up to something high. And the Torah continues in the same way because where it goes from there is then it doesn't come back to the laws in this section. Instead, it goes forward to next week's Parsha, which is Parsha's Truma and the commandment to build a tabernacle. They shall make me a sanctuary and I will dwell in their midst, where the subject is the Shekhinah dwelling among the people of Israel. And the construction of the tabernacle is related to the revelation at Sinai, which describes more of the event that began there. So we go all the way, Hashem is coming down and revealing himself to us. Then we have all these laws, we're, why we're going to understand this more deeply. And then it goes back up to seeing this holy vision of Hashem. And then Hashem says, make me a dwelling place and I will dwell there among them, meaning among all of us. So then it's like Hashem is taking this Sinai picture and saying, we're going to have a place down here in the world that's like a reflection of Sinai. And that reflection is the base of Migdash. So this construction is like describing more of the event that began in last week's Parsha. So in our first meeting with God at Sinai, we transcended the human level in order to prepare for the meeting with God, like out in the wide space surrounding Mount Sinai. So the section of the tabernacle then is the, continu the natural continuation of this encounter. But there's this in between. What, what is all this? Because God wants to, re to reside among us. And as a result, we build him a house, a place for him to dwell. And this is something we focus on all the time, that the base Hamigda should be rebuilt. And this relationship can also be seen in King Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the first temple. Again, a paradox as we described last week. God has chosen to dwell in a thick cloud called Arafel and even the heavens and highest reaches cannot contain you. So God on a certain level hides his face. God chooses, now this is after they made the tabernacle and God says he will dwell in the thick cloud in the Arafel. So what he's saying is that God continues to be hidden. And on the other hand, at the same time, Shlomo says, sing, King Solomon says, I have built for you a residence, a place for you to dwell in forever. Now, part of this hiddenness, I just would like to say something about that. Part of this hiddenness that God is saying that he hides in the cloud has to do with that even though we are having more and more revelation of God and we will have more and more revelation of God. 
we need to know that there is always more. There is always more of God that is hidden, even as he's revealing himself and revealing himself and revealing himself. But it's not just revealed, done. It's always more, always more. And this is something we need to know, that there's always more godliness to be revealed. So even as God is dwelling in the Beis HaMikdash. So these two aspects, God's transcendence and his imminence, which is God being beyond and being here, his presence with us in the world are essentially connected and the same kind of connection exists between the giving of the Torah and the building of the tabernacle. And somebody once showed this to me in Israel, a genius who sat on the corner and collected money, but he was a complete genius. So he once opened a chumash and he said, see, see this? And he showed me how the, the giving of the Torah at Sinai is like the tabernacle, that this place where Hashem reveals himself and the place where we are and able to receive Hashem here down below, how much they're the same. He's a very special man. He should live and be well. So the end of Parsha's Mishpatim and the beginning of the Parsha that follows seems to be the natural continuation of the revelation of Sinai. But now we're finding that most of this Parsha between these bookends of Sinai and the building of the Beis Hamikdash are about down to earth matters, laws and ordinances, which seem out of place. And we see that Parsha's Mishpatim mostly deals with practical things that were not even part of the reality of life in the wilderness. These are not laws that were needed then. And part of the reason for that is because the people of Israel were nourished by the manna so that many laws of Mishpatim were not relevant, not at that time. There was no planting, reaping, or harvest, harvesting. And the economic situations which, brought up it, which are brought up in this Parsha by these laws only became applicable later when the people of Israel entered the land. So we need to see that the Torah is creating this union and preparing the Jewish people for the union that would be in the time that would come that they weren't even ready yet for. So Parsha's Mishpatim is relating to a people who are dwelling in its own land, leading a normal life, having servants and maidservants, cultivating fields and vineyards. But it seems like, again, why is it there? because it seems like it's in the middle of a continuous unit that suddenly these laws that seem unrelated are, putting, are put there. So why are these laws given such an important position right after the revelation at Sinai? So after the exalted revelation at Sinai, the most important laws for the people of Israel to learn even before the laws of sacrifices, karbonot, before the laws of the sanctuary, and even before saying Shema Yisrael, and are the most detailed and earthy matters, like how to treat one's servant or one's donkey. Why? And when God says, these are the ordinances that you should set before them, this is a profound statement. It's exactly these things, these down-to-earth laws that are the fundamental ideas of the Torah. These are the fundamental ideas of the Torah. So we need to make the connection <clears throat> between what happened to Sinai at Sinai and what's happening with these fundamental laws. Now, the Torah seems to put the holiness of Mount Sinai together with the giving of the laws. What's the connection? Why is the Parsha, this Parsha placed in this important and honored place right after the giving of Torah? Now, 
The fact is that our lives, our daily lives, even when we have the temple rebuilt, don't take place in the temple and are not essentially involved with the various daily karbanot, the offerings. We live at home and in the marketplace, in the field and in the vineyard, and all the small details and problems that are part of daily life are where people usually live their down-to-earth life. And that's similar to people daven, they pray, but there, there are things that people do. They go shopping, they do things they need to do. Because these down-to-earth situations are the reality <coughs> of our regular lives. And these are the issues, the down-to-earth regular life that the Parsha is dealing with. So the content of Parsha's Mishpatim is also dealing with man's weaknesses. Because the Parsha is not describing a peaceful life, but is relating to all kinds of troubles and, and problems that we shouldn't have. Theft, crime, arguments, and confrontations. So we hope not to experience such things, but the fundamental ideas of the Torah has to relate to all kinds of life situations, including these. So it's whatever is going to be the situation, the Torah is setting up laws that will help people to know what to do in any situation. <coughs> so the Torah has both parts that deal with larger statements and parts that have to do with legal principles and how all this plays out in practice. But although the Torah does give a lot of attention to larger questions, what we would call more holy or philosophical questions, the basic principles of our belief system lie in the small details and not in the places where there are explanations of our big principles. This is something that a lot of people don't understand. That when we're coming, somebody comes into Torah, and why do they come in? Sometimes people come in because they wanna to connect to God. And then they're asking, so what do all these details have to do with anything? Kosher, not kosher, why so many details? Other people love what they see, Shabbos candles. They see somebody wearing tefillin and they say, wow, what's that? But they, it takes some understanding to realize that Hashem wants to be involved in every detail of our lives. Every detail means everything specific. So, even though we would expect much more information on spirituality and that what we would call the big issues of life, and we're gonna to go to that today to talk about the connection, but the Torah is not built that way. When the Parsha says, these are the ordinances that you shall set before them. In other words, these are the laws, tell it to the people. The Torah gives the main importance to the details a lot to think about here. Coming to the higher matters only on special occasions. Why? Because the Torah deals essentially with details. So it seems in some way like these details are more important than the lofty ideas. But when we go to look at the deeper aspect, we're going to talk about the connection between the lofty and the details. So all of Jewish life is built on the existence of these finely delineated laws and instructions with only a few clearly articulated lofty goals. Somebody has a baby, boy, now what? Okay, gotta start planning for a bris and you have to get a mile. And the mile has to check that um, the child is ready before you do it. And there are all these legal aspects of how you introduce the child into the world and into the covenant. So <clears throat> even though, wow, it's a baby. Wow, we have a son. Wow, how amazing, how holy. Nevertheless, there are a lot of details. One of the things that I do very often when I go to a bris 
Bris, Bris is a very holy time. And it's a time that the heavens are open. One of the times that anybody who's there can pray for anything they want. And very often mothers are nervous. Actually in Yerushalayim, there are some, some people where the mothers are not at the bris because the mothers are in another room someplace because they're going to get all nervous. Now the, and I go up to the mothers and I say, this is something I do regularly. You know, your husband is taking care of the practical down to earth laws. You don't have to focus on that. You are in a place of, that is so holy that you could be praying for your son and Mashiach and whatever you think should be prayed for at this time. So you focus on the godly aspect of what's going on and let your husband take care of the details because both are going on. Now, the Torah, the Torah's questions in general are how questions. How should one act in this case? How does one fulfill this law? How do we make the circumcision of this child? How do we know what to do and in what order? How do we know if the child is ready? Questions of why or what for are not emphasized in the Torah and are rarely expressed. So when something, there's a situation, we don't say, why did you do that? We say, how can I participate in making this better? What can I, how can I do this? What can I do? So the Torah is dealing with the method, the technique and the details by which things are being done, but not so much with the larger philosophical questions. Now from the Torah's overall framework, which includes details, laws, as well as theoretical elements, we do try to go from the details to the general principles and to understand the answers to the questions of why and what for as well. But we don't expect to understand it except to a certain level. Like again, coming to the Brit, there's a lot to be learned about the Brit and there's a lot of explanation of what the Brit does and what the covenant is and why the child needs the circumcision and what it means. And Hasidics goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Do we really, really, really understand why Hashem wants this? We understand to the degree that we're able to understand it, but Hashem is in the Arafel. Hashem is in the deep cloud where we can only go so far and understand so far, because what we're saying is the main thing is to do it. So the Torah has this long list of laws, but the details with all their nuances are the main focus of the Torah. The Torah sees things in a way that's very often different from our usual way of thinking because the Torah is not philosophical or metaphysical. Instead, the Torah finds majesty in the worldliness and in the details, both. The majesty, but the majesty seems to be in the details. How could it be that the majesty is in the details? At Sinai, we look up toward the heavens above, toward what's uplifting. But immediately after, our view shifts downward to the earthly and sometimes unrefined matters. And surprisingly, we're able to see holiness there as well. So in this way, the revelation of Sinai and Parsha's Mishpatim are actually one unit with two interconnected parts that deal with the same question. Where is the majesty? Is it found in heaven alone or elsewhere as well. And in our lives, the most profound and uplifting things are found in the mundane details of daily routine. The Talmud actually says that the Holy One, blessed be he, has no place in this world but the four cubits of halacha. That means God is dwelling in every law that we do. Every mitzvah we do is a place where we draw God in. 
So we're used to raising our eyes up toward heaven when we speak about God. But the truth is that he's found in the small, insignificant, and seemingly unimportant details of halacha. So God's majesty could be found right down here. And King Solomon mentions this problem when he's praying. Will God really dwell on earth? Even the heavens and the highest heavens can't contain you. How much less this house that I've built. But this is the essence of the temple where God contracts himself, as it were, into a limited space. So God at Sinai, it was up in the big spaces. But when it comes now afterwards, and this is what we're heading for in the next Parsha, which is already hinted at in this Parsha, that God doesn't want to be all over the place. God, of course, God is every place, but God wants to enter this small house. And it, God says, as we'll see in next week, and I will dwell in them. God wants to dwell in us and in our homes. That means that God wants to enter right here. Coming down from the heavens, God goes to reside in the temple. In order to engage with his people in the four cubits of halacha. To discuss what the law is here, if a person knocks out a Hebrew servant's tooth, or if a person, person's ox gores his neighbor's cow. And I have to tell you, each of these very practical mitzvahs has meanings that are huge and Kabbalistic. An ox doesn't only mean an ox. Everything goes all the way, all the way, all the way up. But God wants it to come all the way, all the way, all the way down into the world. So all of this comes to one conclusion. <coughs> Contrary to our expectations, the most exalted things cannot be found above but below. So this is what God wants. Now, we all believe in God, the people of the nations believe in God, but they take the opposite perspective. They say God is exalted above all nations only when his glory is in the heavens. For the other nations, God's dwelling place is in heaven and he remains there. They do not understand down to earth mitzvahs. He can reveal himself equally in heaven and on earth, even in the smallest details, the earthly details. This is our, how we live. So after the exalted experience at Sinai comes the real revelation, the one that makes us aware of the highest experience that God wants for us. So that's what happened. That in Parshas Mishpatim, it demonstrates that exaltedness can be found in all of its many details, details that go beyond the generation of the wilderness to affect all the upcoming generations, even to this day. It's very interesting, you know, you, you just as an example, since I do dating counseling, sometimes you see a couple dating and they're looking at each other in the eyes. It's so romantic and it's so beautiful. And then they do get engaged and they decide to get married. And the thoughts are about buying candlesticks that are beautiful, buying a gown that is beautiful. What shall we feed the people at the, what's the menu going to be for the wedding? And the details are these kind of details. And then there are Sheva Brachas and the family brings breakfast to the couple. And then there's dinner and they don't go very far. They stay together. And then what a surprise. The candlesticks are meant to be used for a real mitzvah. And they got gifts of dishes and pots and pans. And the dishes and pots and pans are supposed to be used for down to earth 
cooking, shopping. It has to be kosher. You have to think, what am I putting with what? Which dishes am I using for this and this? How do I prepare for everything? And suddenly you realize there is life after marriage. The holiness of the marriage continues throughout the entire marriage, but it needs to be brought down into the details. The Chabas is kept as it should be. And, and, the, and the food is kosher. And when he goes to work or she goes to work, there needs to be giving tzedakah. How much tzedakah? How and to whom? And what are the laws? And suddenly after the marriage, things start to get very down to earth. Now that doesn't mean that it's all down to earth because the union is a holy union of man, woman, and God. <clears throat> and they should be learning more. What does marriage mean? What is the connection? What does Hasidi say about the husband and wife and who they are together? But it has to come to down to earth because if at four o'clock and five o'clock and six o'clock, they're still looking at each other in the eyes and there's no supper to eat, something is missing. So looking at each other in the eyes has to translate into how do we build a home? And in the building of the home are all the details of what needs to happen so that God is found in the details. So now let's look at Tanya and what Tanya says about this. This is Hasidut. This is the inner teachings of the Torah about what this all means, because now we've come to a conclusion, but we need to understand where it's really coming from. So Hasidus is discuss discussing the inner Torah understanding of our deep connection to God, to God's will and to our purpose in the world. So God put himself into the commandments. This is the secret of the essence of the Torah. God put himself into the commandments. The commandments are not something else. And the first word of the Torah, Anochi, I am, spells out a sentence, Ana, Nafshi, Chetavit, Yahavit. And Hasidus says this means I put myself into the Torah. I put myself into the Torah. So the Torah isn't just a shopping list. The Torah is I put myself into the Torah, which means that when God is saying that he gave the 10 commandments, God is saying, I gave you myself. I gave you myself. This means that the Torah in effect is the essence of God. So the Torah is not just a handbook for proper living, it's the essence of God himself. Now, the essence of God is in every part of the Torah equally. Whether the subject is about the oneness of God or whether it's about the signs of unclean animals or whether it mentions Moshe or Pharaoh, God is equally within every part of the Torah. So it's all meaningful, all of it. It's all means that God is in it. So there, we need to understand, what does it mean? God is in the entire Torah. There is only one existence, God. We say this, ain od mil vado, there is nothing but God. What does that mean? Everything else is simply dissolved or absorbed in that oneness. What does that mean? That God, and that means us too. We are all coming into this world as God's expression in the world. We are each of us expressing godliness in the world or we're absorbed into God, where we're connected into the oneness of God. It's very important to know that we are connected into the oneness of God because all there is is God. 
and that what we're doing in the world is expressing godliness. Everyone and everything manifests God. So it's not like what it said. Anochi means amabvir, and all these laws are, you know, here's a shopping list. No, all there is is God. God placed himself into the Torah. So God is, all there is is God. Everyone and everything manifests God. Now the Zohar says, the first two commandments, Anochi, I am God, you're God, incorporates all the 248 positive mitzvahs. And you shall not have any other gods, incorporates the 365 negative mitzvahs. That means all positive mitzvahs are affirming the oneness of God. All negative mitzvahs, thou shalt not, are saying there is nothing else but God. If God does not want us to eat a pig, what does that mean? Somehow or another, that is not an affirmation of God to do that. That's what God is saying. An affirmation is stronger, is not strong enough, because if we're saying that all the positive mitzvahs are incorporating, I am God, and all negative mitzvahs are incorporating, and there are no other gods, the, everything is a statement of the oneness of God. And that's why we only heard the first two commandments directly from the mouth of God because these two incorporate the whole Torah. So we focus on the oneness of God and a denial of any existence outside of God. Now, God has a desire, a plan, and a purpose for this world. So God's will, his face, his innerness, is the source of all life. It energizes all the worlds. That means we're not separate. God is the source of our life, our individual lives. And God is the energizing the everything in us and in the whole world. So the general princes of Ju principles of Judaism that Aseret Hadib wrote means not 10 commandments, but 10 utterances or overarching principles, and that all the Ten Commandments are divine, and so are the details. When we're saying your husband want, would like supper, and he likes soup, all these details, he likes the soup, and he doesn't like it too salty, and then all that is part of supper for your husband, which is reflecting the union that you have together. So the union the holy union is expressed in every detail of the supper. The mitzvahs have just two themes, accept one God and do not accept idolatry. That's what this is all about. Every mitzvah is a connection with God and a rejection of idol worship. Judaism consider, considers our outward behavior to be of primary importance. Why is that? So it says in Ecclesiastes, at the and the conclusion of the matter is, observe his commandments, for this is the whole purpose of man. So this is what we're in the world for. This is what we're in the world for. So we need to know this. Um, we're here for this one purpose, to bring godliness into the world, to connect to God in the details of life. There's a letter that the Rebbe wrote, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he wrote to somebody in response to a question. And the letter says, <coughs> this concept about the oneness of God that we're expressing in everything 
is one of the central aspects of man's purpose in life. To establish this truth of the oneness of God in everything and to spread it to the utmost extent of his influence. This is not merely an idea, but a way of life which is expressed in daily life and which permeates the whole inner being of a chassid. And a chassid means anybody who is living with inner Torah. So what this means is that the oneness of God is established in our minds, in our hearts, and in everything we do. And this becomes how we live, and it becomes our entire inner being. So what that means is that when we're in any situation, how is the oneness of God expressed here? The, the Rebbe continues in his letter, also divine providence extends to each and every particular in the creation, everything, a leaf. And this is direction from God. So what is the Rebbe pointing out? That it's not just we're down here and God is up there, but we are part of God and God is part of us. And God's Torah is full of godliness and that in our living with God, what we're doing is we are, this is our way of life. This is what we do. And this is who we are. And the divine providence means that God is with us and giving us direction. So that means by divine providence, we may find ourselves in a particular place that we didn't expect to be. And we were sent to wherever we were sent. Why? Because of the oneness of God, we were sent to accomplish a mission in that place, bringing light into the world. So God is showing us by teaching us his Torah that he is in, he's showing us what to do in that place at that time by giving us the setting to do God's will in that opportunity. So it's just me and God, each one of us, if I'm an expression of God and each one of us is an expression of God, that's who we are. And if God has put us in a place or a time or a situation, how are we expressing this godliness in that place or time or situation? So this expression of the godliness that's in us and in the opportunity of the moment is what we are here to do. That's why we have all these laws, all these halachas guiding us to know what to do. When we're dedicated to our focus and connection on God and God's Torah and mitzvahs, we shape the world through the will that God is sharing with us. It's also important that we are shaping our own world. Shaping our own world. This is, takes time and attention, but when we make a decision and we are doing something, <coughs> that means for godliness to live in our home, for godliness to live in who we are, that we are shaping the world. This is called in Hasidut and in Kabbalah, form over matter. That there's matter, all kinds of stuff, but we form it for what is it used. So we're learning Torah and we're doing mitzvahs and we're shaping our way of life, the world, and bringing godliness into everything every day. Now, last week we spoke about that we can look at what is the main place we're coming from. Are we looking for at the world from God is the one, everything is godliness, or that the world is what we think is normal and we have to find God? 
Now, from God's view, the universe sees everything as part of him. While we also have a human perspective in which separate entities are real. So there's a paradox here that the truth is that all there is is God. And yet God put us each into a body with a specific name at a specific time in a specific situation. And the Torah is bridging these two perspectives, divine and human. The Zohar says the Torah and God are totally one. And the Zohar is saying that the 248 positive mitzvahs are the 248 organs of the king, which is a pure expression of God himself. So this means that the, in, that the mitzvahs are the innermost will of the divine and his true desire. That's what God wants. So the mitzvahs are God's will for what he wants in the world. And as I said, every mitzvah means a lot more than we think it means, but it comes down right here, right down to earth. So when we carry out God's will, the innermost divine will is disclosed through our actions in a way that God's face shines. God's face means God's innerness, God's expression that God wants for us. And then nothing can experience, be experienced as separate in any way from God. And people then don't feel like an isolated, independent reality. So in being connected to God and his mitzvahs, we are completely connected to God in what, who we are and in what we do. So <clears throat> the mitzvah represents God's inner self as it is dressed in all the created worlds. God wants mitzvahs to be observed. And because of that, he created the worlds to make that possible. God wants the mitzvahs to be expressed in the world. And because of that, God created the worlds. The life energy, that might sound like it's really, how could that be? But then a person can say, you know, I would like to have a place in my house where I have a desk and I have svarim, I have my books, I have a filing cabinet, I have pictures that are important to me so that so that I can express myself in doing what I am here to do. So what does that mean? That means you take a little room, a little room that wouldn't have a lot of significance and it's too small to be a bedroom anyway. And you say, I'm gonna put a desk in there. I'm gonna put bookshelves in here. I'm gonna put, photographs that are significant to me and inspiring. Why am I doing these things? So that I can be myself and express myself in the world. So when we think of it that way, and you say, God made the world, this little world, this little room is a world that I made so that I can express myself in it for people who love to cook. They make a room that is big enough and has enough of everything in it to facilitate their expression of who they are. So they make a world. A kitchen is a world. So the worlds that God made are places where God can express himself in the details. And that's why we have the Ashgachah Pratis 
of God putting us in situations so that God can express himself through us in the details of life, in the place and situation that he's giving us. And sometimes we have our own inner, true inner desires of things we want to do, like to have that desk that could be a true inner desire where I say, I know that there's going to come true expression through this. I went to visit a elderly lady. She's, she has in her backyard, she said, I'm so happy with my backyard. I, I wanted to see it, so I went to see it. Pots, pots of vegetables and fruits and plants. She just loves it because it's a place where she can express herself. And she said, it's not a beautiful garden, but it's mine. And we have to know that this world, it says it in Bati Lagani, that this world is God's garden. So we are in God's garden where, you, where God is uniting with us. And in the details of the garden, we are, our, our connection with God is being expressed. So the life energy and flow to all the worlds is contingent on mitzvah observance in our lower world. Through Torah and mitzvahs, life energy flows to the world. I remember hearing this once from my teacher of Gedalia Koenigs at Sal, that he said, certain mitzvahs connect to certain places in the world, to certain kinds of people in the world, that each mitzvah is connected to something in the different in the world. And we may not realize at all that when we're doing a certain kind of mitzvah, we are supporting a country or an area or a nation or something else going on in the world that we are bringing godly energy into that place. So each of these acts causes the light and life energy from God's will to be dressed in the world. Remember, we said that the mitzvahs are how God likes limbs of, the, of God. And we are dressing these limbs. We're dressing the world by bringing these mitzvahs down in whatever specific places or situations we're in. We don't always know it, but sometimes one person can change somebody else's life by doing something that's very small because you are placed in that place where you can make a difference by what you say or by what you do or by what you give or by what you receive or what you hear or anything. We don't know why. Hashem places us in situations where we change the world. So these mitzvahs are God's inner will and true desire. And that's why the world is sustained by mitzvahs because for the sake of the mitzvahs, the world exists. So when we are observing a mitzvah, we need to know that our soul is a garment of action. In other words, the soul is going into this mitzvah. That the limb of your body that you used is also going into godly action. When somebody picks up a book and that means they're going to learn Torah, then the hands, the mind, the hands, the desk, everything, the energy that you used, and the energy of the object that you used are all connected directly with God. When we're in the process of doing a mitzvah, it's like a chariot to its rider. So everything becomes part of our godly service. Everything. We don't always understand it, but the simple expression is we're going to drink a cup of tea. And the tea comes from some country in the Far East. And the cup comes from some country someplace else. 
when we are saying a blessing on that tea and we're going to drink the water, we are elevating the place where the tea was picked, the fields of the people from which it was picked, the people who picked it, whoever made the cup, whoever gave you the cup, everything becomes elevated through the blessing that you say on this kosher tea that you drink for the sake of serving Hashem. So all the specifics elevate the whole world in the way that God wants. So the Torah is the divine will. And the mitzvah act is expressing the divine will. And all the laws of the Torah are channels through which the inner will itself flows. Even the tiny details of the law convey God's will. That's why we say, what tea would you like? Because one tea is expressing your will and the other tea, I can't drink that. That's not my will. And so when we're in a situation and we're doing it with God's will, then what happens is even to the details of the tea that you drink and the particulars of the world and of every situation anywhere at any time is expressing godliness. The laws are the channels of flow through which divine light and energy reach us. Not only do we obey God's will through the law, we also receive that will as it flows into the universe through observing a particular precept. So when God is saying, this is what I want you to do, we are receiving godliness. Like the soup that if your husband likes soup or if your husband likes a salad with supper, whatever it is, that you are bringing the holiness of your marriage into a salad or a soup. Why? Because that is his desire. And it is your desire to bring that holiness and godliness of the marriage all the way down to the table and the tummy and the health and everything else. So it's not just, okay, I'll make a soup, I'll make a salad. You want a soup, you want a salad, you get a soup, you get a salad. No, but it's all part of something much bigger. So mitzvahs which are observed are performed by our outer garment of action. In other words, we do a mitzvah in action. Torah is totally one with God and studied by our inner garments of speech and thought. So learning Torah is a very essential part of serving God and it comes down into mitzvahs. But our Torah study represents a complete merging with the divine. In other words, these are words that God is speaking. Tell these mitzvahs to, these are the ordinances you shall say. And God is speaking these words through Torah. And when we're speaking these words, that's why it's good to read the words out loud. We are speak, God's mouth is speaking the same words that we are speaking. In another place in time, it actually says this is like a kiss because our words with our mouth are meeting God's words with God's mouth. So learning Torah is higher than the mitzvahs, <coughs> but bringing God's will into the world makes the world godly. When we say Shema, the next words instruct us with the commandment to love God. But in Devarim, it says, and God commanded us to perform all these laws in order to revere God. Having awe of God is like constantly standing at Mount Sinai and recognizing that our purpose in the world is only to live this connection. So this is love where we want to be connected and awe where we're saying whatever it is that you would like. Any transgression 
detaches a person from God at that moment, just like idolatry. Because when somebody is doing a transgression, it's like they're saying, who cares? Who cares what? That all there is is God? No, we have to know that all there is is God. And the transgression is something that we don't want to do because we, because we have awe of God and we don't want to be separated. When we do a mitzvah, our divine soul, our energizing animal soul, both our divine soul, our energizing animal soul, and their garments of expression are all merged in total union with the divine will and infinite light in God. So we are whole in serving God. And any mitzvah that we do connects us with God forever. How can people go against God's will? That's the basis uh, and root of idolatry, which is a mistaken perception of separateness, which leads to an inflated ego. When a person thinks that he is an independent entity separate from God's sacred presence, then his ego gets bigger and bigger because he thinks it's up to me. It's all up to me. God, what God? It's all up to me. When he thinks that and his ego gets bigger, then he doesn't connect because he is involved in idolatry, which means that not believing God. In truth, everything is unified with the all-consuming presence of God. Nevertheless, we do function in a world of separate consciousness, which God gave us so that we could have free choice to choose to do what God wants. Every activity of man, even speech and thought, affects the whole cosmic order. Whatever we do and whatever we think affects the whole cosmic order. It's not nothing. Everything is meaningful. Mitzvahs, good deeds, proper intentions, and acts contribute to the ultimate awareness of living unity with God. This makes us partners with God who placed himself into his Torah so that we can make the world a dwelling, a dwelling place for God. So whether we're learning about Sinai or the specifics of the details of how God wants us to bring godliness into the consciousness of the world, we have been making this world a tabernacle a temple in which God's presence is known. The Aleph of God's Anochi, the first letter, fills the world until it's clear that the hiddenness of the exile will soon have been transformed into the revelation of Geula. And we accomplish this through expressing God's true desires and the de true desires of our own inner being into the details of everyday life. So what we see here is that every detail is essential and meaningful, and that whether we're connecting with God in the higher way, which seems to us like the higher way, or we're connecting through every detail we do, it is all essential. It is all connected. It's what we're here to do. So when we're learning what we call the big picture or the inner picture, we spoke about Sefer Tanya and how it's telling us how there is, it's all God and it's all connected. This is, awakens us to say, each one of us here is an expression of godliness and everything we do is intended to be expressing godliness in the world. So may we do this and may God reveal himself more and more, which is what's going on now and will be so. And may we have the base of Migdash so that we have these options also. So may we be blessed to do what we are here to do and accomplish it with joy and make the world the way God wants it to be in the most beautiful way.